So, welcome to this uh, new physics colloquium. Today, it's a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Lucas Novotny. Probably all of you that work uh, or have any interest in photonics or nanophotonics will not need uh, me to present him in any way because you know him. And uh, just to tell you, uh, he's considered one of the fathers of nanophotonics. He's been in, in that field for the last 20 years. Uh, more interestingly, he has been covering both aspects, that, both experimental and theoretical aspects, which is not common, not everyone is able to do that. And he's obviously the author of uh, the very famous book on nano-optics that most of you have seen. And I've seen it on some of your tests. So, to give you a very brief curriculum of Professor Novotny, he, was, uh, he did his uh, PhD in ETH, and then after that he moved uh, to the US uh, where he worked with various people including Sunny Chi, who is very famous as well and uh, he has been uh, in the last 15 years a professor, professor at uh, Rochester University where he went through all the courses on honoris from uh, assistant professor to associate professor and full professor like uh, six years ago and after that he moved uh, well, after they actually got the various distinctions, including, interestingly, uh, for me at least, he is a distinguished inventor professor at ICFO, Institute of Chemical Sciences, and uh, two years ago he finally was uh, called back by Europe and he came back to his uh, alma mater, uh, to ETH, where he is now a professor. So, join me to welcome uh, Professor Wilson. So, um, welcome, thank you for being here. I'd like to thank my host for having me here, for his hospitality and all the people I met yesterday and today for introducing me to very interesting work that is going on here at uh, Bilkent University. So, um, what you see here, well, before I start, I should actually introduce all my um, co-authors on, uh, on this talk. Um, most of the results that you will see have been done by Jan Giesler. Jan Giesler is a graduate student. Well, he just graduated. Actually graduated here at ICFO and now moved to uh, my lab at ETH in Zurich. Um, so he acquired most of the data that I will be presenting and discussing in this presentation. Um, then there's, there's DJ Jain, Lloyd Ronda, Eric Kebestreit, Okay, they are working with me at ETH Zurich on this project. And at ICFO, this effort is uh, basically um, led by Roman Guidon. And the students involved is Francesco Ricci and Marco Spazinovic. Good, so um, this presentation is really very basic because all it is about is this little particle here. Okay? It is a little nanoparticle, 100 nanometers in diameter, and it is being held in place by a focus laser beam. And all we do is to, to basically monitor the dynamics and control the dynamics of this particle. And, okay, since most of the physics is explained in coupled oscillator terms, this is one oscillator. So it cannot be simpler. Okay, so believe me, okay, this is a nice model system, and although it's only one oscillator, it contains a lot of physics. Good, so um, this is uh, to present a little bit the wider context of what we're doing in my group at the ETH Zurich. Um, the main theme of my group is on what we call optical antennas, and this is pretty simple to explain. We explore mesoscopic structures that we call antennas. And the purpose of these mesoscopic structures is to increase locally the light-matter interaction. Okay, so these structures are like a near-field lens. They concentrate the radiation on a target or they help to release the energy from a localized source. Good. Uh, this is the topic of today, and then we also have a project on nano-optofluidics, where we explore nanoscale channels in a microfluidic network, 
in order to read out little entities like viruses or contaminants in the fluids. Okay, so this is the theme today. Um, to motivate what we're doing, uh, this is shown here. Um, most of you will be probably familiar with this concept of optical tweezers. Omnipresent in the in the lab of uh, Giovanni Volpe, and he's also writing a book, okay, on that topic. So what it is is that <clears throat> there is a force that is exerted on polarizable matter, and that force drives the particles into zones of high intensity. So basically, when the particle sits at the focus of a laser beam, its energy is minimized. That's why it wants to stay there. Now, mathematically, this is um, expressed like this. So we have a gradient of some intensity field or electric field distribution. And the prefactor here is the polarizability of this particle. Now, the challenge is that optical tweezers are mostly um, used in dissipative media. Right? Fluids, for example, where you have viscosity. And so if a particle gets into the trap, okay, there will be enough friction for the particle to be held at the minimum of this potential. But now imagine, okay, the skateboarder entering a half pipe, but there's no friction. There's no friction. Okay? So basically the, the skateboarder will exit on the other side with the same speed as he came in. There's nothing that will hold him at the minimum of this potential well. So the quest here is how do we slow the skateboarder down in an environment that doesn't naturally have dissipation? So let's say ultra high vacuum <coughs> or in outer space somewhere. So slowing it down in, all, in, in another terminology means okay, we're cooling it down, okay, we're extracting energy out of the skateboard. So how do we cool him down? People have thought about this mostly in, in the context of molecular physics. So people have developed start decelerators, or here decelerators based on the Zeeman effect. And Mark Raisin calls this atomic coil gun. Well, Mark Raisin is from Texas, so that explains why it's a gun. <laughs> Anyway, so, so these technologies okay, are good okay, for smaller entities like diatomic molecules. But to scale this up to mesoscopic <coughs> structures like nanoparticles, this is still out of the scope. So this will not do. Now, people came up with proposals of taking these particles into cavities and basically using the laser field or the optical field in these cavities to extract energy from the particle and to effectively cool the particle. And these two proposals that appeared almost simultaneously back in 2010. There, was, there were proposals to use active feedback in the context of atomic trapping. And then there was this demonstration by the same Mark Raisin who basically used the radiation pressure force in order to cool or slow down a microsphere. So the emphasis here is on microsphere. So in order to exert sufficient radiation pressure, you need a, a large cross-sectional area. So what, what is being done here, whenever the particle leaves the center of the trap, you crank up the laser power in order to push it back. And you do this from all the directions. You're always pushing the particle back into the center by the radiation force. OK, so this is just a summary of what has been around. And all of these techniques have their advantages and disadvantages. Our objective is not to use a microsphere, but a nanoparticle. And this will become clear later on. Because our objective is ultimately to drive or basically cool such a particle into the regime of quantum mechanics. So where the oscillation of that particle becomes quantized. And in order to do that, we need a small particle in order to avoid 
recoil the heating. So photons will collide with the particle and give rise to mechanical recoil, thereby it reheats the particle. I will, I will get to this later. So our approach is shown here. And in fact, it is very simple. If I, if I told you there is a dish, a ball, there's a little marble swinging back and forth, and I give it to you and I say, well, stop the ball. Now we stop the, the marble. You will do automatically the right thing. No? You will start to move the ball. And you will move it just in the right way to counteract the motion of the marble. So you will do automatically the right thing, but most of you will probably not know what you're doing. The same way like the child who's sitting on the swing and accelerating, the child is moving the legs. Okay, but just in the right frequency in order to accelerate. So the child doesn't know what it's doing, it just works. So what is essential here, we have to observe the marble. Okay, then we process this information, we use our brain, and ultimately we act back on this motion. Okay, and that's what we're doing here. So, to make it simple, whenever the, 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 the particle leaves the center of the trap, we move the dish or the ball up, and that stiffens the potential, so it prevents the particle from deviating very far from the center. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, Professor, how it is different from the usual laser cooling? Okay. Here we are not direct, here we are modulating a potential, a trapping potential. Okay. In the laser pressure, we apply a dissipative force. Okay, we apply friction to the particle. So there, there is a difference. I will get back to this. Okay, so this is the outline of this presentation. I give you a short introduction, then I will talk about how to amplify this little marble, and then I talk about how to cool it, and ultimately I will, I will focus here on uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. This is still ongoing work, and it nicely connects also to projects that are going on here at the uh, building. So uh, this is a problem statement. Um, it's actually pretty simple. Here is this little marble, our nanoparticle in the laser focus. We observe it with a detector. Then we have some control electronics. And we act back here on the laser field in order to keep this particle in the center. This is the equation of motion. Okay, So R is the position coordinate of the nanoparticle. Here we have a frictional term. Okay, here. This is our potential energy, or the restoring uh, elastic force. And then we have here two driving terms. One is a fluctuational term. This is due to the random collisions of air molecules. But it also accounts for the collision or scattering of photons. And then here we have an optical force. That's a deterministic force, which is actually generated by the feedback. Now, if we assume that the feedback okay, keeps the system in thermodynamic equilibrium, then this dissipation constant, gamma zero, and this fluctuational term, or this force, they are interrelated by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So the correlations of the fluctuations basically determine the frictional constant. Now the next term here, uh, basically, this, this, this frictional constant we can then also express in terms of the gas pressure by the mean velocity of the air molecules and by the size here, uh, by the area of the particle. Alpha is the polarizability, and the polarizability um, has again uh, size dependence. So, the bigger the particle or the bigger the volume, the, hot, the larger is the uh, polarizable volume. And then here we have just a dielectric factor. OK, then um, this is the focal field. This is the gradient of the field intensity close to the focus. And as I said, this is our feedback. 
And in order to do work on the system, this has to be a non-conservative force. So basically, integrated over one oscillation period of the particle, this force has to be non-zero. Otherwise, we cannot do any work on the particle. Okay, so what we do is we assume that the oscillation amplitude of the particle is very small. At least this is the regime uh, that we are interested in. So then when we go back here, then this gradient of the electric field distribution can be linearized. And so that's what we're doing here. This trapping potential is linearized. And then we have here just a spring constant or the trap stiffness that is basically responsible for holding the particle close to the focus. And what's important here is because this is a non-uniform field distribution, the trap stiffnesses are different in the three uh, major uh, directions. Okay, what's nice about this is that this linearization decouples the different translational degrees of freedom. So we end up with an equation for the x-coordinate, a similar equation for the y-coordinate, a similar equation for the z-coordinate. So we have a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator equation. It could not be simpler than that. Okay. Now, here, the oscillator, the natural frequency is now given by the trap stiffness divided by the mass. And the trap stiffness can be adjusted by laser power. So by modulating the laser power, we can modulate the trap stiffness. Well, the trap stiffness is also proportional to the polarizability of the particle and the area of the wavelengths and uh, some optical parameters of the, of the uh, system. Now, this is a summary of the parameters that we're using. We have typically about 50 milliwatts of laser power and numerical aperture of 0.8. We use wavelengths in the near infrared. This is our bandwidth of the control system. The typical size of the particles is on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers. This is the mass. Okay, and if you plug this all in, and you find this is the trap stiffness, and this is the oscillation frequency. You can then go to the experiment. Here is the particle is being held. All what you see here is this is scattered power. Okay? The laser beam is going from right to left. This is the focusing objective here. So you don't see the laser beam going forward. All you see is the light that is being scattered at the particle. So you can see this with your bare eyes or with the camera. Okay, there's enough scattered light. This scattered light is captured by a detector that monitors the position, and this is more or less in real time uh, the, the detector signal. So you nicely see this oscillation, and this scales very nicely with this formula, so it's about 125 kilohertz. I mentioned before this trap stiffness scales with the laser power, and now you see we have the trap stiffness here plotted for x, y, and z. So the particle oscillates with a different frequency in the x direction than in the y or the z direction. We have three different oscillation frequencies. Okay. This is because we have three different <coughs> trap stiffnesses. But all these trap stiffnesses, they depend on the laser power. And you see that we have a nice linear relationship. Good, so um, you should know that um, a harmonic oscillator has a Lorentzian power spectrum. So if you just take the Fourier transform okay, of a harmonic oscillator and you form here the power spectral density, then you get this formula. This is a Lorentzian line shape function. And you see here, this is the Lorentzian of the motion in the z direction. This is in the x direction, in the y direction. This is on a logarithmic scale. So you see here the center frequency is different for the three different directions. And once the particle escapes, this is our background, and we can calibrate this background. The background or the sensitivity in our experiment is 1.2 picometers per square root hertz. So that, that sets the limit of you know, what is the smallest oscillation amplitude that we can 
So, um, this line width here, if I go back, the line width which we have in here, okay. as I alluded to before, depends on the gas pressure. So we can generate a better and a better vacuum. Okay, this has been done probably here at six minibars. And we can go to UHV conditions, and this line will become narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And that's what we measure here. So here we go down in pressure, and here we measure the line width for the three different axes. And you see that at 10 to the minus 5 millibars, we have a line width of only 10 millihertz, and this gives us a Q factor of 10 to the 7. And there's no reason why we can't go further. Okay, so we can continue here and go all the way down to UHV to 10 to the minus 9 millibar and achieve fantastic Q factors of 10 to the 11. And the problem is how to measure such a Q factor because if we just use a ring down measurement, we have to wait several weeks. Okay. So usually we don't do these experiments over such an extended time, but just by extrapolation, that's where we get it. Okay, so um, let me now talk about amplification. So the experiment is the following. It's again this marble that is in this dish oscillating at some natural frequency omega. So if you don't do anything to this ball, the marble will just oscillate at the oscillation frequency omega. And now what we are doing is without observing what the marble is doing, we are going to shake okay, the ball. And we're going to shake this ball with a modulation frequency omega mod. Okay? So very simple. We have two frequencies. So let me explain you what's happening here. This is again the equation of motion. And now this optical feedback force due to our modulation is given by this expression here. So the we modulate here, and that modulation okay, gives rise to a modulation of the trap stiffness. But the trap stiffness acts on the particle's motion. Okay, so let's think about this. Okay, this is our modulation. Yeah, that's how we move our dish up and down. And this is our particle oscillation. And again, the oscillation frequency is omega. Here I call it omega naught. And you see this is a multiplication, so this is non-linear. It's obvious, okay, if you have multiplied two frequencies with each other, you will generate some and different frequencies, or you will generate side bands. And that's what really happens here. So forget about this axis for a moment. Let's just concentrate here on one line. So the color scale tells you the energy in a certain spectral region. So here, this line here, this is the unperturbed oscillation of the particle. This is just a marble in the ball. It would just oscillate at omega not under 25 kilohertz. And now we start to modulate or shape the ball. And we're going to generate side bands. And these side bands are shown here. Okay. So here we have the difference frequency, and here we have the sum frequency. Okay, and that branch goes all the way to zero and then folds back and intersects here our unperturbed oscillation in this point. There's a lot of interesting other things okay, that I'm going to skip, but let's zoom in up here. The color scale that you see is the intensity of the oscillation. Okay, blue means there's not much energy. White means there is a lot of energy. Red means there is a lot, a lot, a lot of energy. Okay? So what happens here, in this region, where our modulation frequency is twice the oscillation frequency, we are amplifying the particle's oscillation. Okay? So this is called parametric amplification. But we have to oscillate here at twice the frequency. Now there's a lot of interesting dynamics, non-linear dynamics, that goes into this little window. You see here the unperturbed particle oscillation coming up. 
then it basically is being pulled to the side and then it suddenly jumps on this new branch where we have this parametric amplification. Okay, then if we now look at the resonance here, then we have a fantastic Q factor. Although we have very moderate kind of pressure. So at this pressure, we would usually have a Q factor of 10 to the 3. But the particle oscillation locks, phase locks to the external reference and assumes the same Q factor as our external source. This is also very similar to how an injection laser works, for example. Okay, so um, this is again this region. So we're coming up here, we're moving up with the frequency, and this is the unperturbed oscillation. We suddenly jump here on this parametric regime, okay, and then it disappears again. So we have here an instability. And if you just integrate the energy in the oscillation, then we see that we have gain. Okay? We amplify in the oscillation. Now let's start with the frequency up here and, and, and slowly move down. Then we get this. So we're passing this instability point, but now get actually to a new frequency where we suddenly jump back on the unperturbed oscillation. Okay? So what we have is an hysteresis. A by stability. If we go with the frequency up, we jump up here on the amplification, and as we move down, we switch back on a, at a different frequency. Okay, now with this system, with such a bistable system, you can build an oscillator. Okay, you can build an oscillator to basically switch back and forth between two stable situations. You need a positive feedback for that. You can also just use noise, external noise, to basically amplify the particle's motion. So this is still work in progress. Um, some of this is described in this paper that just appeared recently. So now let me go to cooling. The same experiment. <laughs> We're modulating again our dish. But now, we are not doing this independent of the motion. Okay? Now we are going to observe the particle and act back on it. So we have the same equation of motion. We have the same optical force. Okay, so again, if we move this dish up and down, then we are modifying the trap stiffness. And the trap stiffness acts here on the particle. But what we now do is that this trap stiffness, this time dependent, is dependent on the particle's motion. And we purposely here introduce a nonlinear frictional term. You see here this term, okay, the velocity term is associated with friction. Okay, gamma zero here is a frictional constant. Here we also have a velocity dependent term, x dot. But it is also being multiplied with x squared. That means that large oscillation or large amplitudes of the particle will perceive a stronger damping. Right? It's a nonlinear damping. Okay, the experiment it looks like this. So we're modulating the laser power. Okay, the, the modulation of the laser power is a modulation of the trap stiffness. We have the three detectors that pick up the particle oscillation, and then we feed that information back uh, to the modulation. So, what we then can do is because the optical force now depends on the particle's coordinates. Okay, so this term now depends on the coordinates. We can fold this term back to the left-hand side, and what we get is a modified damping constant and a modified oscillation frequency. <coughs> so the feedback, all that it is doing, is modifying the damping and it's modifying the oscillation frequency. Good. It's still a harmonic oscillator, no? I mean, if we go back here, this is a harmonic oscillator. 
but it is harmonic oscillator. We have a shifted damping and a shifted frequency. So the power spectral density will look like a Lorentzian again. This is our Lorentzian. And again, in the Lorentzian, here we have a shifted frequency and we have a shifted damping. Now we can integrate over all frequencies, all oscillation frequencies. So it's just os integrating over Lorentzian. And then we get the mean square oscillation amplitude that can be expressed in this way. Then we assume that the particle is in thermodynamic equilibrium. This is an assumption at this point. And then we can invoke an equipartition principle and basically assign to this motion, to this mean square amplitude, we can assign an effective temperature or a center of mass temperature. <coughs> so so what, what we do is we basically assign to the energy of the particle a temperature. That's what we do. Good. So if we now take this result and we plug it in here, and we assume that the frequency did not change appreciably, and this is justified, then we find the following is that the center of mass temperature of the particle is the initial ambient temperature multiplied by the ratio of the line width. Okay, so this is the line width of our unperturbed oscillation. And down here in the denominator, we have the line width in presence of the feedback. Right. So basically the feedback is able to cool, it is also able to amplify or heat the particle. Now, there is a justification why I assume that the frequency doesn't change much. You can show that this is a second order effect. To first order, the feedback affects the line width, and to second order, it affects the frequency. So that's why this is a reasonable approximation. So we've done the experiment, and you see that here we started ambient kind of temperature, 270 Kelvin. Okay, this is the pressure, and then we go down with the pressure. And we monitor here the line width. We end up here with temperatures of 50 millikelvin. This is showing the trend as we go down with the pressure. This is the three different axes. So the temperature of the x motion, the y motion, the z motion. And we end up with about 100 to 50 millikelvin. Now here is a jump. Okay, Why is there a jump? Because we increase the feedback gain. Just wanted to see what happens, okay, if in the feedback loop we increase the gain. Well, if we increase the gain, our cooling is more effective, and that's why there is this apparent discontinuity here. Okay, so how, how low can we cool? How low can we cool? Well, you know that we cannot bring the particle to stand still. Okay, that's what quantum mechanics dictates. A harmonic oscillator can never stand still. There is energy associated with the ground state. And once we enter, okay, uh, this regime where the oscillation becomes quantized, basically the energy states are separated by a quantum of oscillation. So this is h bar times omega naught. So omega naught is the, the particle's oscillation frequency. Now if we want to resolve one of these quantum states, then basically the thermal energy has to be smaller than the energy difference between the states. Otherwise just the thermal energy will populate these states and we will not be able to resolve them. So, this is basically just saying what is the ratio of this quantum of energy, of quantum of oscillation here, in, in, uh, in relation to the thermal energy. And so in order to resolve the quantum ground state, this number has to be smaller than 1. Okay, so this happens then at the center of mass temperature of 6 microkelvin. And remember, we were at about 50 millikelvin. So we have four orders of magnitude to go. So our feedback loop should be a little bit more efficient, and hopefully then we get there. Where does that happen? 
So let's go back to this data again. So you see this is the pressure. And now let's ask ourselves, where do we have a temperature here of 6 microkelvin as we go down with the pressure? And this happens at the pressure of 10 to the minus 10 millimol. So a very feasible experiment. It just needs a very good vacuum pump. The problem is that the signal goes down too. Right? The signal that we measure scales with the temperature. So if you integrate over the Lorentzian function, then the result is the temperature. <coughs> so as we go down with the temperature, the signal that we have available scales down in the same way. So at one point it will disappear in the noise, and our feedback loop will not work. So that precludes us to get into the quantum ground state, and maybe we have to adjust the philosophy of our feedback loop. Maybe it's not good to observe the particle at every instant of time. We think about this, we don't need to know where the particle <coughs> is. All that we have to feed back is the frequency and the right phase. But we don't need to know where the particle is. Now, as we get into this regime where the particle gets cooler and cooler, the vacuum is better and better. So the random collisions with air molecules are eliminated. And this will not be anymore the limiting factor. What in fact will happen is that the photons that measure or trap the particle will generate recoils on the particle. In other words, if I take a certain number of photon energies, and I say that this corresponds to one quantum of oscillation energy. Okay? That's basically how I transfer the energy to the mechanical system. Then I can calculate what is called the photon recoil rate. <coughs> and I skip through this, but um, what is interesting here is that this recoil scales with the particle size to the sixth power. And that's the reason why we're dealing with nanoparticles and not with microspheres. Because if we have a microsphere here, then the photon recoil will be so strong, and that will preclude or prevent us from uh, getting into the quantum regime. What is interesting, if we assume that we reached the ground state, let's say we reach the ground state, but our laser is on, and we're detecting, okay, during this evolution in the ground state, we're detecting the scattered light from the particle. Now what's remarkable is that before such a recall event happens, there are 10 coherent oscillations. So this is what distinguishes this from atomic trapping and cooling experiments, because if you have an atom, as soon as you observe it, you destroy its quantum state. There is enough photon recoil to destroy the atomic uh, quantum state. Here we can observe the oscillation with a budget of 10 to the 9 photons. 10 to the 9 photons can be scattered before such a recoil happens. You would think, well, that somehow violates some laws of quantum mechanics. Now, how can I observe a particle in the quantum ground state? I should not be able to know where it is. In fact, with a budget of 10 to the 9 photons, I don't know where the particle is. Okay? There's an uncertainty, okay? As the, which is given just by the shock noise in the system. Okay? I can observe it, I can measure it, but I don't exactly know by uncertainty where it is but I have 10 to the 9 photons available to play with. Okay, so let's get to this topic, non-equilibrium dynamics. In this experiment, we do the following. We trap the particle and we cool it. So I convinced you, hopefully, that with this feedback, we can cool it down to, let's say, 1 Kelvin. Okay, so the particle is sitting here. It's cooled by this feedback in 1 Kelvin. And then at a certain time, we just open the feedback loop and allow the particle to relax back to the ambient tem uh, uh, temperature. So we just look at the reheating of the particle. 
At the later stage, okay, we also add here a signal in order to, during this relaxation process, deterministically control or basically uh, manipulate the particle. But let's forget this. Okay? Just at a certain time, we open the feedback and let the particle reheat. So what happens is, uh, basically, this, this is how we start out, okay? This is the feedback. At a certain time, zero, we switch it off. And then, as we want it to the particle, this is now the mean square amplitude, this is what happens. This is over a period of four seconds. So it starts out here with a very low amplitude because it's cold, and then it starts to reheat. Now, it looks a little bit chaotic, okay? But I, I would just like to emphasize, this is four seconds. The oscillation, okay, is a fraction of a millisecond. So if I zoom in here, what I see is a nice harmonic oscillator. So on a small scale in here, this oscillates like a harmonic oscillator. But as it reads, okay, I have all these fluctuations. Good, so then we repeat the experiment, okay? We recapture the particle, and then we let it go again. Okay, and then we get this. It doesn't look like the previous trace. It looks a little bit different. And every time we repeat this, we get a slightly different trace. This is the next time. So now we repeat this experiment 10,000 times. And we take the average of all these trajectories. And what we get is this. Right? So this is like a diabetic reheating curve. Okay, a curve that you would get if you assume that at every instant of time, the system is in equilibrium, or there is a local temperature. Okay. So on average, this is true. But for a single realization, we're completely off. <coughs> OK, so we looked a little bit in the literature of how people deal with such systems. And we came across what is called um, the fluctuation theorem. So the quantity that we calculate is the heat. It is basically the energy of the particle okay, minus its initial energy, the energy when we let it go. Okay. That's basically the energy that it gains or it loses during the reheating process. And this is time dependent, okay? So we can make this measurement at different times t. Okay, so now, let's say we fix the time t to 20 milliseconds. So we let the particle go, and exactly 20 milliseconds later, we calculate what the, what the heat is. And we repeat this 10,000 times. Then we get a distribution for the heat. And this will be this yellow curve. So you see, it's not completely symmetric. But there is probability that during this reheating, actually, the particle gains energy from the environment. So, somehow your stomach should say this, this violates some laws of thermodynamics. Okay? How, how can we heat it up? But on the small time scales, that can happen. It's almost a reversible process. Now, if we now fix the time at the later stage, okay, let's say 150 milliseconds, and we do exactly the same thing, 10,000 times, okay, we let the particle go, and exactly 150 milliseconds later, we calculate the heat, we get a new distribution function, that's the blue one, and now you see how it's skewed to the positive side. So it is more likely, okay, that the particle, okay, is heated up and it gives energy to the environment. Okay, then what does the fluctuation theorem say? say? It says that if I look now at these probability distributions, okay, the values, and it doesn't matter, okay, which one I pick. I just freeze the time. Let's say I take 100 milliseconds, okay? This is independent of the time. So I take the distribution, let's say for the green curve, I go to positive value, 0 0.1, and I go to the negative values, minus 0 0.1, the ratio of which, okay, 
should correspond to such an exponential factor. Now, in order to test whether our system satisfies this fluctuation theorem, what we do is we basically take here the logarithm of this. So basically, we don't compute exactly, or we don't plot this ratio. We, we compute what is what is here in the exponent. Okay, the sigma here. And of course, this being an exponential, this being an exponential, so sigma should be linearly dependent on the heat. So what we expect is this, okay? That's what we expect according to theory, okay? So we have this linear relationship. And now if you overlay this with our measurements, this is what we get for the different kinds. So as you see, we have a very strong deviation. So based on this, we conclude the fluctuation theorem does not hold for our system. But that was quite a bold statement, OK? And I didn't have the guts to make such a claim. And that's why I got in touch with my friend Christoph Dilago at the University of Vienna in order to discuss this issue further. Well, what we realized is that due to the feedback our system is not in an equilibrium at an initial point. We are in a stationary state, but the stationary state is not an equilibrium state. An equilibrium state has a Gaussian distribution. And let's see what we have. Okay, now, now this, this, this is an experimental plot. Okay, so, so um, just to appreciate, to acquire something like this, the student is two days straight in the lab. So it looks almost like calculated, but it is not calculated. So these are like 50 to 100,000 experiments. This is again time. At time zero, we let the particle go. And here is the distribution, the distribution in position. So if we now take a cross section at the very initial time, we have this, okay? It's a nice Gaussian. At the later time, it's a Gaussian. At the much later time, it's a Gaussian again. So it suggests this is always in equilibrium. The problem is, it is not. There's a deviation here, okay? This is spoiling the fluctuation theorem. There is a small deviation from an equilibrium distribution, from a normal distribution at time zero. And that deviation, okay, generates the deviation of the fluctuation theorem. So is the fluctuation theorem wrong? No. Heat is the wrong parameter. So we expressed the fluctuation theorem before in terms of heat. The heat is the variable. But if we start out in a non-equilibrium, then the heat is the wrong parameter. And that's how we were educated by Christoph de Lano. Basically, what we have to consider is the relative entropy production. It's again the fluctuation theorem. But in terms of a different variable, now delta s, you see the sq, the heat is there, okay? So that's the change in energy, but then we also have the entropy change. And for the specific case of our feedback, nonlinear feedback system, it is possible to analytically calculate our initial distribution function. So again, it's a steady state distribution function, but it is not an equilibrium distribution. Okay, so we're going to repeat the whole thing. This is basically in terms of heat. And once we express everything in this uh, relative entropy production, nicely fits the theory. Now, if this is true, it should be actually, it should hold to any initial steady state distribution. The initial steady state distribution we generated was due to a feedback. But we can now also use a drive. We drive the particle into a certain distribution very deterministically and let it go from them. Okay, and so what we do is we drive it 
with a function generator at a certain frequency. So if the particle is initially a harmonic oscillator, its distribution, position distribution, will be double loaded. Or if you have a harmonic oscillator and you have a camera to take a snapshot, you're most likely to capture the oscillator in the turning points because the velocity is the lowest. So if you're capturing here the particle in the turning points because it's an oscillator. And then we let it go and basically monitor as it equilibrates with the environment. And so we can monitor now the distribution function as it evolves from this double load pattern into a normal distribution. And we have, again, we apply now the, dissipate, uh, the fluctuation theorem in terms of this relative entropy production, okay? And long story short, it fits very well. Okay, so let me now come to the end here to, uh, to, to, to give you an outlook of where we're heading. So all I talked about is about this system. So we monitor the particle and we act back on it. And we use here a feedback loop. Now other people in the field, they don't use an active feedback loop. They put the cavity in here, but they achieve also a feedback. It's a passive feedback. It's a feedback where I don't have to observe what's happening. Basically, when the particle moves, it detunes the cavity, the field changes, the radiation pressure changes, and the force on the particle changes. Right? So, so that is a back action. Now you can nicely calculate, okay, if, if you assume this is a closed system, okay, and the energy is conserved, so you can derive a Hamiltonian. So basically, if I have the particle in here, it polarizes, it stores energy, okay? So it removes the energy from the cavity, and that's why the resonance of the cavity changes. This is shown here. There's a linear relationship. So if I now calculate, okay, what my Hamiltonian is, I have the field inside the cavity, and I have here my energy of the particle. Then I can insert this interaction Basically, I'm just replacing omega by this expression. And if I do this, okay, I become, I get this interaction term. Now, I'm skipping here through a little bit fast. Um, just believe me, at the end, I can express it this way. So I have here that my cavity field, my energy in the cavity. Here I have the energy associated with the particle motion. And here I have a coupling term. And what's relevant here is that the coupling term has exactly the same appearance as what we do with the active feedback. Because, well, you know, it's more complicated, but you see this is nonlinear. This is the particle position, this is the energy, and we're multiplying these two and that generates sidebands. So the whole physics in here is in the nonlinear interaction term that generates sidebands and in our ability how we deal with the sidebands. Now, I mentioned that we can generate very high Q factors, 10 to the 11. And if we have such a high Q factor, we achieve also very high force sensitivities. I will skip through this, this is in the literature, but basically the minimum detectable force in a certain bandwidth, okay, can be expressed in this form. So what we have in here is the ratio of the temperature to the Q factor. So the smaller the Q factor is, okay, the lower is the force that we can detect. And we can detect with a Q of 10 to the 11 forces that are 10 to the minus 20 newtons. Now that doesn't say much to, um, to most of you, but this is the gravitational attraction between you and the person in New York. Okay, that's the force, 10 to the minus 20 newtons. So it's a very tiny force, and our particle in this vacuum system has such a force sensitivity. So there's a lot of experiments, okay, we can think of uh, sensing, you know, uh, short-range forces to interfaces, like the Casimir von der Waals force, also frictional terms, okay, so if the particle moves close to the surface, okay, it can actually experience friction, 
Okay? So some people call this vacuum friction, some people call this dissipative on the Wiles force. We could actually have a particle that is magnetic, and then we could interact with single nuclear spins in the surface and read them out. We can monitor phase transitions, and some people doubt that Newton's <coughs> law is complete, that there is a term that nobody measured so far, and so one could actually also do measurements when, when, where one could set lower bounds to such deviations. So ultimately, we can, as I alluded to, we can also look at a magnetic particle or a particle that has an intrinsic spin, like a diamond and V center, where we actually couple okay, the spin dynamics internally to the center of mass motion. So very similar to what people do in ionic trapping. Okay, so they address the internal states of the ion, but as the ion undergoes oscillations in an external potential and interacts with neighboring um, uh, ions. So this brings me to the end. This is my summary, and in fact, whatever I told you is in this equation. So it sounds very simple, but uh, physics is very rich. And in fact, you find all this physics in the textbooks. You open a book on nonlinear dynamics, you find these terms. So one of the terms is a parametric drive where we amplify. Then we have a feedback term, okay? This is a nonlinear damping term where we slow the particle down. Then we have nonlinearities. I didn't talk much about this, but basically for larger oscillation amplitudes, the trapping <coughs> potential is no longer harmonic, but there are the unharmonic terms. And these anharmonic terms, they couple the different degrees of oscillation. So we can actually exchange energy between the x-axis and the y-axis by exploiting this duffing. And again, I would like to highlight that whatever experimental results that you've seen have been acquired by one of the same students, and this is Jan Easy. And I hope you will have some questions. So well, thank you for this very nice talk. Is there any question? For the first part of the talk uh, about the application, uh, you show a graph uh, where the, the initial frequency was 125 uh, hertz setting, and then the enhancement was about this, twice the size of that frequency. Was this like a second harmonic generation phenomena in the system, and can you go like higher harmonics? So are you referring to the fact that the modulation, the external modulation, is at twice the frequency of the particle oscillation. Okay. So this, this is, in, in fact, at the heart of a parametric effect. Okay. So basically what we are doing is we are redistributing by this the energy on the side bands. So we are taking energy away from the particle and putting it on the side bands. Okay. And this is done most efficiently when you're exactly in this regime. So for a parametric effect, the external drive has to be at twice the frequency. Um, most of the noise uh, present in the system is probably close to white and noise. Would it be interesting to introduce uh, you know, brown and pink noise? If yes, I, I can think of ways of doing that with a tailored laser beam. Okay, so in, in, okay, I would say we don't want noise. Okay, because noise limits how far we can cool. It is, of course, very interesting to study the interaction <coughs> of the particle with external noise, because uh, we can actually have a stochastic kind of amplification of the particle oscillation. This uh, we have studied with white noise, but not with other noise sources. But once we have the feedback active, 
Okay, then we get, you know, what, uh, what I just learned yesterday. We, we have multiplicative modes. And so the time delay of the feedback, okay, actually that acts back, recirculates the noise and generates probably a very interesting phenomena which we didn't uh, pursue so far. So it is something, okay, that is on the map, but uh, so far we didn't get into this. Uh, professor, if uh, the duffing term dominates, is there any possibility of observation of any kind of solitonic-like behavior? Electronic behavior. Solitronic. Solitronic behavior. So you have to educate me about solitronic behavior. Uh, soliton, I want to mean soliton, oh, because it is soliton. the cubic term is there. Yeah, okay. Let's say I don't know. <laughs> I didn't think about it. So you have a three dimensional oscillation, right? Yeah. And uh, you go every of these modes, right? Yes. Not only one. But... All three. Okay. So each of them have different frequencies. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So um, this is the way we're doing it now. Okay. So so in principle, if you think about this, you don't need to know the direction which the particle oscillates. All you have to know is whether it leaves the trap center. So whenever it leaves the trap center, you have to stiffen the trap. So there are probably much more clever ways to implement the feedback loop than really resolving the three axes as we do it now. So maybe instead of doing three measurements, we could do just a single measurement and feed that back. And so being in a, a, with, a with a periodic forcing uh, in a bistable regime with uncorrelated norms, don't we already have the conditions for stochastic resonance here within the uh, for framework of this equation? Yeah, so, so you're right. We, we, we do have the conditions and we, in, in, we are, in fact, um, right now studying this. So, so compared to other studies that have been done, the advantage here is that uh, we have a, a switching frequencies that are, can be very high. So cantilever-based uh, measurements that have been done, they're usually very slow. And what we also can study here is what happens as a function of ambient pressure, so the external diameter. Because this is a tunable parameter, this is just a vacuum that we, we use for, for uh, running the experiment. In this non leftist, you also have squeezing of the fluctuations in one particle and inflating the other. Do we have this effect? We must have this effect that we didn't study it. Is there any other question? Okay, two more questions. What's about rotation of particles? You always talk about lateral oscillations, but what about rotation? If you detect, if you detect this scattered light, if what particles are rotating in this it's not symmetric relatively to centrum of mass, can additional signal Yeah, so, so yeah, the question is what, what about the rotations? And, and the answer is I don't know, but they are there. Okay, they are there, we just didn't find any signature so far. But if you do a simulation and you let the particle go, and you will see that there are in certain regions, okay, there is a torque. But in other regions there is a torque on the other side. So, so the net rotation, should, for, a, for a spherical particle, the net rotation should be zero. But in the dynamics, of course, it is rotated. But we, we don't have any uh, experimental symmetry. Um, so, so you say, actually, it's an anomaly. Is there any size restriction? Yeah, so there is a restriction. What is the limit? OK, so, so the limit, <coughs> again, if it's too big, then basically there will be too much recoil on the particle. So, so if we ever want to get into the quantum regime, 
the photon scattering or the photon recoil will perturb us too much. If the particle is too small, we don't have enough signal to detect it. So there's a sweet regime which we believe is on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers. Thank you. And one more question. What about the material of this nanoparticle? This is uh, fused silica. Okay. And it is uh, on purpose chosen to be fused silica because you know, if I talk about temperature, what I refer to is the center of mass temperature. But the internal temperature of the particle can be very high. In fact, uh, the, the temperature, the internal temperature, is just given by by balance of absorption from the laser and black body radiation. So we, we, we can't measure that, but of course, if the intrinsic absorption by the particle is too high, we will melt the particle. So, so, so fused silica has a very low absorption coefficient, and that's why we use it. Okay, last, last question. So you were mentioning about the magnetic particle. So what, what would be any interesting uh, when we use these metallic particles? So, so um, of course, we're not going to put it in higher magnetics, right? But uh, we can dope the silica with some ions, ions that have a net spin. So these can be um, rare earth ions. Uh, we didn't think about this too much, OK? But uh, so it's like with the NV center. Okay, and the ground state uh, has a net spin, okay, then we have a magnetic system. Okay, perfect. So let's thank uh, Lucas Nobel team once more. Thank you.